Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome to Synth Stuff. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 inexpensive hardware synths for beginners, those who are new to subtractive synthesis. Coming up next. So I get a lot of questions from people saying, hey, I'm looking to buy my first synthesizer. I really want to get into this. What should I buy? And the answer is not that simple because it really depends on what it is you're looking for. So what I've done is I've come up with a list of 10 entry level, pretty much entry level synthesizers for beginners that are a reasonable price and which all of them are relatively simple to use and easy to learn for the most part. Qualifications means no FM synths. I mean, we could maybe have a synth that has FM capabilities, but we're not talking about a DX7 or an OP6 or something where you'd have to actually learn FM synthesis in order to use it. And we're also not talking about romplers where it's just playing samples of instruments. Again, the instrument may have that capability, but it's not its core function. Basically, we're looking at subtractive synthesis where you have an oscillator, you then run the oscillator through an amplifier, an envelope, a filter, and maybe some effects, and maybe some LFOs as well. So really basic subtractive synthesis, the way it's been done since the early 70s with Moog. Other qualifications, has to have a keyboard. Uh, I'm not talking about modules here, so something you can actually play with keys on it. Uh, it must have physical controls on it. For instance, like LFO, oscillator, amp, filter, FX, like I mentioned. Uh, it must be polyphonic. We're not talking about monophonic synths here. So it has to be able to play at least a few notes at a time so you can play chords on it. All the synthesizers in this list have at least eight voice polyphony. Some of them have as high as 128, unless otherwise mentioned. Lastly, I don't care whether they're analog or digital. Really, this day and age, with the advent of FPGAs and advanced digital processors, it's really tough to tell virtual analog from actual analog synthesizers. By definition, if it's subtractive synthesis, it's usually analog or virtual analog. Most of these are virtual analog with a couple of exceptions. Who cares whether it's analog or digital? The end result is, is it a usable synthesizer that makes good sounds and is reasonably easy to learn how to use? Number 10 on the list is, uh, I'm already breaking my rule here and saying inexpensive, the Roland System 8 that I have sitting right back here. At $1,700, this is not an inexpensive synthesizer. But it is a virtual analog. It has some fantastic sounding engines. It has its native System 8 engine in it. It can also emulate a Jupiter 8, Juno 106, and a JX3P. You can also get other plugouts from Roland that you can load into it that, so it will play the emulations of other classic Roland synths. It does have a simple knob per function layout, so basically LFO, oscillator, and, and so on, like I described, with the exception that it does have a ton of extra options for each of these parameters that is accessible through extremely deep menu diving on the little display there. So yes, it can get extremely complex, but you don't have to get into that extreme complexity to use the thing. It You can use it just by twiddling the knobs on the surface and you can, pretty much figure out how to work it just by doing that. It has some very good effects in it, echo and flanger and chorus. It has the Juno 106 chorus in there with that famous sounding chorus, so that sounds great. It also has FM, uh, a version of FM. You don't have to use the FM, but it's there. It has a, a decent 49 key keyboard. It is kind of expensive, but if your goal is to play live out with, and, and you want to play like an 80s cover band, this is your synth, because this will do every sound that came from the famous 80s synths. The Jupiter 8 was everywhere. This has Jupiter 8 sounds in it, and they're indistinguishable from the original. So if that's what you're looking for, there is your synth. I've done a full video on the Roland System 8, so I'll put a link to that in the description below. Click on that if you want more information on that synth. Number nine, the Korg Mini Log XT. At $730, it's about the middle of the pack. Uh, this is an analog synthesizer. Well, it is. It has four voices instead of eight. I did mention that I was looking for at least eight voices of polyphony. This Mini Log has four. It has two analog oscillators and one digital oscillator. So it has those analog oscillators in there that sound really good and, and rich and, and fat and analog, but it also has that digital oscillator in there that you can actually load wavetables into. It has some wavetables 
by default from the factory, but you can actually load your own in there. You can also load oscillator algorithms from people that design them, put them out on the web, they sell them, they give them away. You can actually load that into your third oscillator so you can actually expand the, the type of oscillator sounds that comes from it. It makes it a, a nice hybrid synth that, that is not restricted to what you get with it from the factory. It does have FM and wavetable capabilities. Again, if you're gonna delve into that, that's not beginner stuff, but it is a just basic analog subtractive synth on the surface. It has a very high quality effects engine in it, and it has a 16 step sequencer. 16 steps is not great, it's a fairly basic, simple sequencer. It's a polyphonic sequencer, so you can record chords. You can also record motion in it, so if you wanna put uh, filter sweeps as part of your step sequence, you can do that. It has smaller keys, not mini keys, but a smaller key bed. It's definitely playable. It's a very capable synth that you'll do well learning on, but it also will take you years into the future. Number eight, the Behringer DeepMind 12. At $879, it's getting towards the upper end of our price range. You can get a six voice version of this for less. You can also get a module version of it, but I recommend you get the 12 voice version simply because a lot of the patches in the DeepMind actually double up on voices. So if you get the DeepMind 6, some patches you're playing, you only have three notes of polyphony, so that's not great. So definitely aim for the DeepMind 12. The DeepMind 12 is a fully analog synthesizer with digital effects. Uh, it is kind of modeled after the Roland Juno 106. It has a lot of the same features and sounds. Uh, any sound you can get out of a Juno 106, you can get out of the DeepMind. It has a fairly simple panel uh, layout for basic subtractive synthesis the same patterns we've, we've talked about already. It does have a rather complex menuing system for patch management. A lot of the parameters, the extended parameters that aren't present uh, as basic adjustments on, the, on the, the main panel, as well as for the effects. It has a very powerful digital effects engine that is responsible for a lot of the character of this synth. The oscillators themselves are, are really nothing special, but when paired with the very powerful digital effects engine, uh, it really makes it a sonic powerhouse. However, those digital effects are not simple to manipulate. So it's not beginner in that sense, but you can use it to get really good sounds. And once you've got the effects in place, you're good to go. It has a 32 step sequencer in it and it has aftertouch on the 49 key, 37 key. I forget how many keys it has, but it has a, a decent key bed with aftertouch, channel aftertouch, not polyphonic, but nice that it does have aftertouch. Number seven on our list, a synthesizer I once owned, is the Yamaha MX-49 at $550. You can get it in blue, <laughs> and mine was blue. I really love that synth, but uh, I had too much duplication in that between that and my Modi X, so when the Modi X came along, the MX had to go away. This is a rompler, however, some of the ROM sounds it has in it are basic uh, synthesis sounds. So it has samples in it of sine waves and sawtooth and triangle and, and square waves and so on. So you can actually use those sounds in there as if they were oscillators. And then it has a full subtractive virtual analog synth in it. So you can apply the filters and the envelopes and everything. So you can use it as a subtractive synth. However, because it has that massive ROM bank in there, you've got hundreds if not thousands of sampled sounds from the motif, and those are very high quality samples. So if you need pianos, organs, guitars, drums, strings, all the, the good sounds that you need to use in any kind of uh, comp composition, you might need those for live. Uh, it has very high quality samples. You can play banjo and bagpipes on it if you want. Plus. This synth is 16 part multi timbral so it can play 16 different sounds at the same time. Great if you're using it with a DAW because you can have all the different parts set up sending on different MIDI channels and you can have all those instruments playing at once from the one synthesizer. It's a full 49 key key bed. It's a pretty nice key bed actually. And this is a fantastic gigging machine. I've seen quite a few professional bands playing with this synthesizer. It's light and it sounds great. It's got organs, it's got pianos, it's got everything in it that you need. So if this is the kind of thing you're looking to do and that you think maybe you're gonna be gigging with a rock band that needs some organs, this is definitely something you should look at. 
Number six is the Roland JDXI at $600. The one common theme with all the Roland synths is that they're a little expensive and, dare I say, overpriced. Like the MX-49, it is a rompler. However, it yes, it has the virtual analog waveforms in there, so it has the triangle and whatnot. It actually has four engines in it. It has two digital ROM-based ROM engines. It has a drum engine and it has an analog oscillator. The two digital engines play from the ROM, and the ROM contains supernatural sounds from Roland, so it's got pianos and organs and synthesizers and things in there. Not the most realistic sounding pianos, but I mean, for what it is, it's, it's good sounding pianos. It also has the basic waveform, so you can do generic uh, subtractive synthesis, just as you would on, a, on an analog synthesizer. The drum engine is fantastic. It has samples in there from all kinds of different Roland drum machines. It has CR-78, TR-808, TR-707, TR-909, along with all kinds of real drum samples, and you can mix and match those. So if you want a bass drum from an 808 with a snare from a, an actual session player playing a snare drum, you can do that. I use, I use the JDXI for drums all the time. It also has a vocoder built into it with a microphone that it comes with. The vocoder is really high quality and you can do regular vocoding. It also has kind of an auto-tune function in there so you can sing and it will jump to the, the correct note that you're trying to sing. Uh, this is a fantastic synth if you want to do EDM. Beats and pounding synths and that kind of stuff, this thing excels at that. It has a four track uh, pattern sequencer that has that Roland TR Rec sequencer function in there. So if you know how to use a T Roland TR Rec sequencer, just like it has in the System 8, same sequencer. Once you know it on one piece of Roland gear, you can use it on all of them. It has a miserable key bed. It's got a, a tiny mini key key bed that is a little bit fragile and I really don't like playing it. I end up actually midiing it from other synthesizers I own and playing it from other synths because the key bed on it is miserable. It's tiny and small, easy to take with you. If you're looking for an all-in-one EDM machine, this is probably what you want to be looking at. Novation Mini Nova at $400. Uh, I don't have one of these, however, I did see one when I last saw Rational Youth because they were using one to play live on stage. This is a neat little virtual analog synthesizer that can produce some really kick-ass sounds. It's got a lot of drive and distortion. Uh, classic analog sounds like you, you could do TB303 sounds, SH01 sounds, all the, the great 80s and grunge 90s sounds that you wanted to get from an analog synth, this thing can do it. It has a simple control layout where it has four simple knobs on the right side and the function of those knobs changes depending on the slider on the right side. So if you can set up amplitude envelope, filter envelope, and that sort of thing just by moving that slide. And then you have one giant filter knob so that you can grab that while you're performing. It has a fantastic effects engine in it. Digital effects, very powerful. You can put five layers of effects per voice on this thing. So it just sounds monstrous. Like the JDXI, it also has a vocoder with an included microphone, and you can also do that kind of basic auto-tune function just like the JDXI. The Mini Nova has mini keys, uh, better quality than the JDXI, no question. It's playable. I mean, I'm not a fan of mini keys, but as far as mini keys go, these are decently playable. Who's this synth for? If you're doing dance music EDM, yes, this is probably good for that. 80s kind of synth pop or new wave, that kind of stuff, it's, it's going to excel at. Also, it's great as a little performance machine because it's small, you can take it with you, and it's usable. It has some really great sounds that you can create with it. Lots of patch storage in it as well. Nice big LCD screen. Number four on my list, I really debated whether this one should be included or not. But in the end, I decided to include it. It is the Hydrosynth Explorer at $600. The Hydrosynth is an incredibly complex synthesizer. I have a Hydrosynth Deluxe right here. It's definitely not one of these. The Hydrosynth Explorer is small, portable. You can carry it around. It'll actually run on batteries if you want. It is a virtual analog synth. However, it also has FM and wavetable in it. It has eight voices of polyphony. And one of the reasons why I decided to include it is because it has a really ideal user interface. It's a supremely easy user interface. If you look at the buttons, you can just see the, the, 
the flow of the sound from the oscillators through the amplifier, through the filters, and, and it, it just follow it from left to right. And looking at that map of the, the sound flow, you can just press one of those buttons and any of the parameters that are applicable to the, that button pop up in the display and you can edit them. It's not quite as simple where you have knob per function controls, where you have, here's your oscillator controls, here's your amplifier controls, here's your filter controls, you know, right out there in front of you. But it is easy and quick to get to each of those controls. And once you get used to how it works, it just, it makes sense and it makes it fun and fast to do sound design on. That said, this synthesizer can get extremely deep. It has a 32 slot mod matrix you can make some impossibly complex sounds on this thing, but you don't have to. If you want, you can just take a triangle wave, throw it through a filter and an amplifier and a VCA and, and maybe some delay effects or whatever, and you're good to go. Simple analog synth, and it works well that way and it sounds great, but it comes with an incredible collection of presets that just really exploit the power of this thing. It's compatible with its big brothers. I could take a, a patch out of this Hydrosynth Deluxe, load it directly into the Explorer. It will play it no problem whatsoever. It has very powerful effects. It's got uh, you know delay and chorus and flange and distortion. And you can route them differently. You can put different layers. So the effects are very good on this. Not the best reverb I've ever heard, but very decent reverb. And unlike any other synth I've ever seen of this type, Yes, it has mini keys, but they are polyphonic aftertouch, just like my big deluxe here, which has polyphonic aftertouch. This tiny little Hydrosynth Explorer has polyphonic aftertouch mini keys, completely unheard of in this market. So that's a huge boost and it really lends itself to more expressive playing. So who is this for? Uh, is it for a live player? Yeah, I could see that. You, you have the macro knobs that really lend themselves to altering the sound during live playing. Is it for the studio player? Yes, definitely. This thing is a studio monster. You can use it for practically any analog sound. You can make piano sounds out of it. You, it makes amazing organ sounds. It makes otherworldly space sounds. You can do just about anything in the Hydrosynth. So, so if you want something relatively inexpensive that's easy to use, but that you can grow into pretty much in an unlimited way, the Hydrosynth Explorer is something you should be looking at. Number three, I actually tied these together for a good reason. They are the Modal Cobalt 8 and Argon 8 at $750 a piece. I have a Cobalt 8X here. The only difference between the 8 and the 8X is that the 8 has 37 keys and the 8X has 61. Both the Cobalt and Argon are excellent synths. The Cobalt 8 is a virtual analog synth and the Argon 8 is a wavetable synth. I, I know I was talking about classic subtractive synthesis. The Argon 8, yes, it is a wavetable, but it has the same subtractive controls as you would have with any other subtractive synth. So I'm gonna include that in there. The one really interesting thing is that they use the same chassis and same control layout for both synths. And by and large, those controls operate the exact same things on both synths. So if you get a Cobalt 8, learn how to use it. Every synth takes a, you know, there's a learning curve how to work all the different controls and, the, and the, the quirks and intricacies. If you then get an Argon 8, you already know how to work it because you already learned it on the Cobalt 8. So that's a real benefit. Both of these are a little bit more complex than a basic subtractive layout, but the one thing that I really like is that they have made decisions ahead of time so that the that you can't set the synth up to do something that doesn't make any sense. You know, if you were going to set the synth up in a way uh, with any of these subtractive synths, I can do something on here and the end result is that no sound comes out. There's lots of ways of doing that. If you make a mistake in, in doing an envelope or a filter or something, you end up with no sound coming out. The Cobalt 8 and the Argon 8, they've made some decisions where you can't set it to do something that doesn't make sense. It really helps you as a beginning synthesis to stay away from frustrating situations where you don't know why the thing isn't working because 
for the most part, you can't get it to do that. If you want more information, I really covered all of this in a, a video that I did about the Cobalt 8, and I, I covered that specific feature uh, along with many others. I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Both the Cobalt 8 and Argon 8 have uh, good FX, not great FX. The reverb is mono, unfortunately. I'd really love to hear a stereo reverb, but it is mono. Both of them have a beautiful, buttery smooth Fatar key bed, full-size keys with channel aftertouch. Not polyphonic aftertouch, but just a beautiful, lovely key bed to play on. And then if you have the room, really definitely spring for the Cobalt 8X or Argon 8X to get the 61 keys, it's $100 extra. So the difference between the 37 and 61 keys is $100. Seriously, if you have the room, get the 61 key because it definitely makes use of it. Number two on the list, the Roland Gaia SH-01 at $750. Yes, I have one sitting right there. And yes, it is Roland, so it is overpriced. However, it is a virtual analog synth that is so easy to use. If you notice, there's no menus on there whatsoever. Every control is right on the surface. Sweetwater actually uses this synthesizer to teach synthesis in their, their learning synthesis classes. It has three complete separate virtual analog engines. So you look at it and you say, oh, I have three oscillators, tone one, two, and three, but those are not oscillators. Each of those is a complete engine, so it has its own independent oscillator, amplifier, VCA, uh, filter, and then they all three run into a set of common effects. That makes this thing incredibly powerful. You can actually play and have those individual oscillator or tones on and off, so you could have a patch with three completely different sounds and just switch between them while you're playing. The filter is a little bit dated sounding. The technology that was used to model filters back when this came out is definitely not as advanced as it is today. So the filters are not quite as warm and creamy as you hear on, on virtual analog synths today. However, it's still definitely a good filter. The thing sounds great. This can actually do some really nice organ sounds. Any kind of classic synth sound from the 70s and 80s, it excels at. It can do that without even breathing hard. This is actually my go-to synth. Whenever I go out and play somewhere live or to rehearsal or whatever, I take this because it's it's nice to play. It has a nice full-size 37 key key bed. It sounds good. It's quick to switch patches and it's small and light. So I really like it. It's easy to learn and like uh, several of the other synths on here, I actually have done an entire full video on this synth, and I will put a link to that down in the description. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. Who is this synth for? Somebody who maybe, like myself, goes out and plays live, wants a, a flexible synth with uh, a lot of different capabilities in terms of generating really great sounds for playing live. Do I use it in, this, in the studio for recording? Not so much. Uh, really, this is more of a live machine for me, but it doesn't mean you can't do that. It's also great for somebody that wants to learn synthesis because all the controls are right there in front of you. It's really easy to learn how to use this and to get really good sounds out of it. And this is the kind of synth where, because it's so accessible, anytime I sit down to play with it, hours go by because it's so easy to get great sounds out of it. It's small, it can run on batteries, which, uh, which is kind of nice. The, it has no menu system. Some of the other functions are buried. There's a lot of shift functions for the more obscure functions. Uh, most of those you aren't gonna need that often. The ones that I do use, I just actually created myself a cheat sheet so I don't have to memorize everything. All right, we've come all the way from number 10 down to number one. The number one synth that I recommend most often when people come and ask me, hey, I'm just trying to get into synthesizers. I'm not really sure. I don't want to spend a lot of money. I don't know much about it. I want to learn what should I buy. This is the synth for you, the Yamaha Reface CS. I've got it sitting up there. It is a virtual analog synthesizer. It's tiny. It does have mini keys, but it has the most playable mini keys of any synth with mini keys that I've ever played. Uh, the, the black keys on it are thin, so I can actually get my fingers up in there. So they did a really good job in the key bed. Uh, it's portable, it has batteries, you can run it off batteries. It has speakers built in, so if you want, you can actually play off the two tiny little speakers in there. It is a completely digital synthesizer, but it is a virtual analog. It sounds extremely analog. It sounds creamy and smooth. You would swear this thing was a giant analog synth with 
lots of circuitry inside. It does have some very rudimentary FM capabilities, enough that you can get some FM sounds out of it if you try. All the controls are across the front. There's no hidden controls at all. It's one knob per function, which is really nice. You can just mess around with that thing all night long and just come up with sound after sound after sound. Very easy to do. And because it has only just those controls and nothing else, it has no patch storage. So you can't store your patches. Well, you sort of can. At the beginning, I used to just take pictures of the knobs like they used to do, and that's how we remember how to how to get a sound back. But you can also use Yamaha's Sound Mondo website, and once you plug it into your computer and go to the website using Chrome, uh, you can then find patches on the Sound Mondo website for free, load them directly into your your Reface CS, or if you come up with your own sound, you can store it on Sound Mondo either in your own private area or you can share it with other people. It has some pretty decent effects for how tiny a little thing it is. And it has a useless phrase recorder. It's not a sequencer. It's basically like a little digital tape recorder in there that is hard to use. And I don't even know why they bothered. Well, that's my top 10 list. What do you think? Did I get some wrong, some right? If you can think of some that I forgot or maybe one that you think shouldn't have been included, leave a comment in the comment section below. If you like what you saw here today, think it's useful at all, please click like, subscribe, click that little notification bell. That way you get notified every time we post one of these videos and it really helps us out when you do that. Thanks for watching.